muted and invited to speak. Please remember to mute the live stream when we uh, when you are called upon to speak. Comments are limited to three minutes per person, and each speaker will be asked to state their name and address for the record prior to proceeding with their comments. All right, let's go ahead. Do we have a motion to approve the July 28th, 2020 minutes? So moved. So moved. All right, it's been, moved by, it's been moved by Council Member Christensen and seconded by Council Member Martin. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. All right, do we have any agenda revisions or motions to direct the city manager to add agenda items? Dr. Waters? Apologize, I muted myself. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Yeah, there are two uh, two items. On the heels of our, our conversation discussion about uh, the short-term rental ordinance and, and, what, and whatever we see back now in terms of the uh, the sense that staff made out of, out of the, the direction we gave. Um, I, I think we need to, my view, and I've heard from residents that we need to take a look at our ADU ordinance um, on the heels of that, uh, especially if we're going to expect to see more ADUs used as short-term rentals. Um, so I'd like to move that um, the, the staff find a time on the agenda on the heels of the, the update of the short-term rental ordinance that we take a look soon at the ADU ordinance. Second. And uh, Dr. Waters, I, I assume that you're talking about the variance, the five feet and the ongoing. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, I was just hearing from a concerned citizen via text wanting to know why that hasn't been put on an agenda. Harold, just out of curiosity, if this motion, I'm going to put it on anyway, so it doesn't matter, but when can we bring this back? Oh no, I need to get with Joni. I know that was I know it was on their list and they were moving through. Because uh, I know the, the reason why it's urgent is uh there's two other there's two other ADUs going up in the downtown area. And uh I know that there are residents who are concerned about you know five feet from the property line um beginning to be the norm and it could alter the feel of downtown if everybody just starts okay. cramming in ADUs. And so if there are people, if there's one there and more on the way, we should probably act before they start throwing them up. So um, it's it's urgent. Yeah, Joni's so, on, so let me get with her tomorrow. All right, great. Um, I'm gonna put it on, but let's go ahead and take the vote since there's a motion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. I had a, I had a second. Okay, go ahead. Uh, it, 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 and it's not an ordinance. Um, but a year ago, we authorized the city manager to engage a, a consultant to do an external evaluation of the rewind program. And um, as, as we did that, uh, what I expressed uh, at the time was my interest ultimately in knowing what we learned. I, I don't care about the report. I think the report is for staff. But I do think if there's something that we, that we learned from the evaluation of rewind, we rewind that should inform us at a policy level and, and help us understand dynamics of relationships between other programs like the Community Justice Partnership and Restorative Justice, it would be useful. Um, so what I'd like to know if other council members share any curiosity in knowing what, what we learned, not, what the, not the recommendations and the findings or the details of the report, just what staff learned and how we'll use what we learned to kind of continue to improve what we do with Rewind and, and the relationship with uh, uh, the community justice, with restorative justice and the community justice partnership. Is that a motion? I'll second it. Well, if, if there's other interests, it's, then yes, it's a motion. I, I, yeah, I think, and plus the other thing is, I think, it, again, this is one that I was going to put on anyway. So, but uh, uh, the other thing is, I would actually, not only, I mean, we're going to vote on it, but when it comes back, Harold, I'd also like, um, I know that there's been, I've gotten a lot of calls, um, people upset on some of the findings, believing that they got some things wrong, um, as well as some things right. So I'd like to, I, I'd like to hear a full report on the report. But um, there's a motion on the table. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right. Uh, it passes unanimously. So just bring it back as soon as you can, Harold. I know you're busy. All right. Anything else? All right. Seeing nothing. Let's go ahead, Harold. Do you have a COVID nineteen report tonight? We do. Um, we're going to start off with um, Susan Motika from Boulder County Health. 
um, and she'll and she'll give a report. Then we're going to move to Roberto Luna. There's an item that you're voting on today. We wanted to talk a little bit about um, regarding our wastewater system, um, and then I have a quick update on the restaurant token program. So Susan, take it away. Thank you, Harold. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am the Strategic Initiatives and Policy Director at Boulder County Public Health, and Jeff Zayak, our director, was sorry he could not be here tonight, uh, but asked me to sh share some facts with you about the COVID situation, always evolving. So an update on the state mask order. Um, as you may know, I'm sure you get feedback on this, the state mask order has been um, interpreted to require that people wear masks in cubicles. And this has generated a lot of feedback. So this is not outdoors, indoors, in offices that don't have closed doors. Uh, the state's mask order is due to expire on August 15th. And our county attorney's office has advocated and asked the state for clarification um, and some modifications. So we'll see um, a assume this order gets extended. That's what we're thinking from Governor Polis and to see if there are any modifications that are gonna make helpful to people, things like the plexiglass barriers that they've already installed and uh, social distancing measures and things like that. So I would say look for an update from us early in the week. We're expecting an answer on a before on or before August 15th, and then perhaps some um, clarifying information uh, shortly thereafter. So I wanted to let you know we've been doing our Sentinel survey. This is where we send out a team of people to monitor masks all over the county. We go to sites all over the county, and we actually observed 2,603 people in July for mask wearing compliance. And these are at places like um, parks, uh, stores, um, service places, and we're seeing 95% compliance in those places. And um, however, um, the social distancing is significantly lower. And this is, you know, this is a bit of a concern for us. So the mask wearing is in a very strong position, but as you might expect in the summer, some retraction on the compliance with social distancing um, outdoors. So another point that I update I wanted to make is um, the Metro Denver Partnership for Health. And I'm sure Jeff has reported on this before. This is a collection of the metro area public health directors in the seven area counties. So they've been collaborating with CDPHE on um, interim guidance for schools, that's K through 12, handling outbreaks. So um, we know that BVSD and St. Vrain are gonna be starting remote and Jeff um, reaffirmed that for me today that that's still the plan with our school superintendents. Um, but assuming things do go in person again, having a plan for uh, recommendations, interim guidance for schools to handle um, those really inevitable outbreaks that are gonna occur is important. So um, this will be something we can share in the next few days as well. I would think by early, early next week, we'll have more information on that. I'm sorry, is that, I'm sorry, uh, Councilperson Hidalgo? Yes, um, I wasn't sure if I can interject in between. Oh, please, please. Okay. And if I don't know, we'll figure Let's, it out. Go okay. ahead. Sorry, Mayor. Mayor, oh, is that okay? I was just, I was just gonna say, I was just gonna say, let's let's wait till the end of the presentation, and then okay. we can go ahead. So just let let's all write down whatever notes or comments. Wait till the end, and then we'll you'll be the first one that I call. Okay, on. thank you. And it's That's in okay. regard to outbreaks with, um, even though we're online. I'm sorry, Mayor, I should have asked you what no, your protocol right. was. <laughs> yeah, let's just go ahead. I, I prefer to get through the presentation and then we'll then we'll have questions because we might, a lot of times we get those questions answered. Okay, fair ahead. enough. Um, okay, uh, Susan, if you could go to the first slide, please. Uh, the next slide, please. Okay, so this is our cumulative cases and information about our cumulative cases. I want to call out a couple facts. Um, at the end of yesterday, which was Monday, we had 26 cases. 
Sunday we had eight, Saturday 16, Friday 19. So as I um, shared with Harold a few minutes ago, we are in general seeing higher case counts and you're gonna see this as I go through the presentation. Um, and we need to keep a very, very close eye on that. So right now, 14.2% of cases um, are in long-term care facilities and we see 77% of deaths from long-term care facilities. And that's as of yesterday. Next slide, please. This is that kind of confusing slide that is showing, if you look at that upper right-hand corner, it's showing that seven county area in the metro region. Um, so in terms of raw numbers, you wanna look at the red line because that's Boulder County. We are now lower than all but Broomfield and Douglas County. However, as I said, we are still seeing um, an uptick in cases. Next slide, please. So this is our five-day rolling average of new cases. So our five-day rolling average of cases is about 13.6 cases per day. Next slide, please. We have some good news on testing. Um, our current five-day average percent positive of people who tested is two point who were tested is 2.4 percent and our five-day average percent positive is 3.3 percent and I'm sorry for that typo it says on 7-1 that it, number 3.3 is current right now next slide please um, so this is our five-day rolling on COVID tests and again, we see that the percent on positivity has remained steady and is heading downward. Next slide. The next slide looks at our positive cases per 100,000 by municipality. And you can see that Boulder City is now neck and neck with Longmont in a case rate per 100,000. Next slide, please. This is a slide I'm sure you've seen a number of times, but it's the age breakdown, the presenting rate per 100,000. So you see a high spike in the 20 to 29 age group and uh, what, we, what we would think of as very predictable, the 80 plus category being high as well. Next slide, please. This is our sources of transmission. And we're continuing to see community transmission with limited person-to-person -person transmission. And that's typically people among the same household where a clear source can be identified. And we're also starting to see some cases associated with travel. No surprise since that's the summer. We're in the summer now. Next slide, please. So this is showing our racial ethnic breakdown. And in the past uh, 10 days, we're seeing 51% of our cases with a known race and ethnicity being Hispanic Latin X. So this, as you know, in Boulder County represents four times the Latin X proportion in the Boulder County population. We've been seeing that number go up and that is a great concern to us. So moving on to hospitalizations and deaths. Next slide, please. You can see that the most significant source, the orange is, is uh, deaths and the blue is hospitalizations. You can see that, uh, and this has been a very consistent finding that the most significant age groups are elders for hospitalizations and deaths. Next slide, please. So current hospitalizations have been trending upward. We've got 15 people hospitalized as of yesterday. Um, we had a higher, higher count of people hospitalized um, last week, but we're continuing to watch that very closely. Next slide. Next slide, and just to remind folks that we are currently in safer at home following the governor's orders. Stay at home is the most restrictive order. 
and we are we are striving to get to the protect our neighbor, which as you know, is the governor's plan where counties actually have to satisfy and meet certain criteria in order to advance to protect our neighbors. So that criteria that we're tested on, if you will, by the state um, includes, or I should say that we have to, you know, submit these results to them, um, include hospital capacity, case counts, testing, case investigation, and contact tracing. Next slide, please. So out of these protect our neighbor metrics, we have four that are met, four that are partially met, and one that is not met. So where we are strong includes sufficient hospital bed capacity, although we keep a very close eye on that, sufficient PPE supply, sufficient testing capacity, and documented strategies to offer testing to close contacts. So where have we partially met? This would be fewer new cases, the ability to implement case investigation and contract, contact tracing, documented surge capacity plan for case investigation and contact tracing, and mitigation and containment plans developed and finalized. So I should say that we are in a very strong hiring phase of um, trying to get through and hire 10 case investigators right now. This is gonna be extremely helpful along with the people we've previously hired. So, you know, we're on our road to satisfying a number of those metrics. Um, we have not met the stable or declining COVID hospitalizations to a su sufficient percentage yet. Next slide, please. So these are uh, key COVID data resources that help direct you directly to our webpage, to the exact um, pages and sources that are dealing with illness and recovery, the summary dashboard, hospital resource dashboard, and the CDPHE COVID data. So this can be very useful to bookmark for you. So that is what I have for tonight. All right, let's go ahead and uh, Councilmember Rodolfo Faring, do you still have a, count, uh, a question? Yes. So the first one I had was um, when you had talked about schools and handling the outbreaks. Um, though we don't have students, we're not doing the hybrid or in, um, or mix in person online. It's full online. However, we do have daycare that is occurring in each of the buildings throughout. Um, you know, my biggest concern is, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, St. Brain Valley School District is the largest employer of Longmont residents. And so, you know, it does have an impact for the community at large. Uh, all, right now, all teachers are required, and I'm not sure of the case for um, Boulder Valley School District. I think it is that teachers are required to be in the building for, um, to conduct online learning uh, lessons. And we are, and they are allowed to bring their own children to the classroom. So we do have a mix of daycare students and staff children in the building, along with um, all staff. So um, is there anything in place right now to how to mitigate or handle outbreaks in the event that does, you know, God forbid that does happen? Have, have they explained that to you, what that plan is? So, you know, we have our regular, um, what, you know, we, if we feel sick, how we go in. Um, I was just wondering from your, you know, so we've been, tr we're still, right now it's, we're going back and we're getting our training. I had some meetings today and we have more tomorrow and the day after. Um, so I was just wondering what um, the county has Okay stipulated or all right consider. so i think that the best thing i could say is providing that interim guidance just as soon as we get it because it is going to um address those issues and it sounds like even though you don't have the kids coming back that you have other situations involving uh people's kids mm -hmm. the daycare i'm listening to what you've said so you're just wondering what the 
if there is a um, recommended protocol or guidance for that. So I will find out and I will raise that question yeah. with our community mitigation folks that deal with education and on the Metro Denver Partnership for Health uh, call, which is tomorrow, okay? Okay, and then the other piece is, has there been any projections? So as we start opening up more and more facilities, um, has there been a projection on okay, we anticipate so many more cases or so many more hospitalizations. Um, has there been any dialogue or discussion around that? Um, the biggest fact that I would have on that is the modeling from the Colorado School of Public Health. Colorado School of Public Health, just as a couple weeks ago, they found that our um, percentage of social distancing was at in the like 41 percent and they projected if we keep that up uh we're going to be at a potential surge capacity by labor day and then just in the last few days that number has improved to mm -hmm. around 70 71 percent and we think that you know no one has a crystal ball here but that may have been predicated or um, encouraged by the state mask order, people got very serious about wearing masks. And we've heard that anecdotally all over the state. Um, but as the state epidemiologist said, she said, I can't get real excited about this 71% number because as you can see, even from the data that Jeff and I present, things go up and down and we have to keep monitoring on a very, very frequent basis. Um, so the other thing I would say is, no, we don't have like, if this, then that, if that, then this, you know, some kind of, you know, very mathematical formula right now that's very specific to our community. But what I would say is, you know, we're very concerned about this confluence of factors. You know, the return of BVSD, the return of St. Vrain, eventually, um, CU is coming back next week. And then shortly after, we've got the flu season starting. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Jeff and the team at Public Health are monitoring data. And I presented a selection of slides for you, not mm -hmm. the whole. We have other, other slides and other data that we're monitoring on a daily basis. So we'll just be keeping in touch with you. And we have a, you know, a direct um, line to, to Harold to talk about developments that both of us are seeing. Okay. Thank you. And then um, sure. I guess this is more towards Harold. Um, and, you know, if you've already sent it to us, I'm a, I apologize, but the links that um, she had shared for uh, the other um, data resources. I think those are in the, Marika sends those to you okay. all, and so I'll make sure that she sends I'll that. Um, the other thing I would add to what Susan said based on, and, and you heard the Surgeon General say this yesterday, there's three things that they're really hitting on wearing mm -hmm. masks, socially distancing, and washing your hands. Mm -hmm. And the data is now really starting to show that if, if we do those three things, those are really powerful. Mm -hmm. And so I think on the modeling question, at least my conversations that I've had with folks, it, it's really how well we do mm -hmm. in terms of what the model will look like. And so past is there, but you wanna really look at how well we adopt those three principles in terms of how that can adjust the model. Okay. Is that accurate, Susan? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Harold, because um, Jeff and I were just sharing that a couple of um, studies on masks have also indicated that where government is stepping in and saying, look, folks, you have to wear masks, that we are seeing better results. And we've seen better compliance in Colorado as a result of that. But um, we'll, we'll have to keep a very close eye on this. Okay, um, I'm sorry, there's another question. Yeah, Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, this is my bad because I got interested in considering the areas of attainment and partial attainment, and I completely missed what was our area of non attainment. Oh, okay, hold on. Our area of non attainment, I think, was the hang on. It was the stable or declining COVID-19 hospitalizations. It's Thank the you. ping ponging that you're seeing. It's the up and down. Are there any other questions for Susan? Okay. Now, um, the next, 
um, update that we wanted to give you all. And Susan, you're free to go or you can listen to Roberto's because it's about the meeting we're going to set up. Uh, okay, but you can I turn your I'll camera. Listen. You can Thank turn you. your camera off, off if you, you want. Bet. Um, the, uh, the next update, um, uh, Roberto Luna, Roberto, um, you want to go ahead and turn your camera on? So you have heard us talk about the work that we're doing in our wastewater system and, and what we've called the biobot testing. And there's an item today in terms of the work that we're going to do with, um, CSU. Um, and, and I've asked Roberto to talk to council about this because, um, what's happening is we're actually now scheduling a meeting with Jeff and Susan and Boulder County Health staff to then take our data and take Roberto's data and start seeing where we can um, see if there's connections because his data really is probably a, a true leading indicator. Um, Roberto, take it away. Can you unmute yourself? There you go. Yep. Thank you, Harold. Uh, Mayor Bagley, members of council, good evening. I'm Roberto Luna, Water Quality uh, Laboratory Supervisor. I'm, I'm with the uh, Business Environmental Services and the Public Works and Natural Resources Department. Uh, I'll be presenting information on an ongoing project for monitoring the COVID virus in wastewater. Uh, Susan, can you start the presentation? Uh, next slide. Back in March of this year, a company named Biobot uh, sent out a uh, invitation, national invitation to wastewater treatment plants, asking them to participate in a program to monitor wastewater for the virus that causes uh, COVID-19. Uh, this project was based upon research that had been done in Australia and the Netherlands uh, that indicated two things. One was that you could find the presence of the virus or detect the presence of the virus in wastewater. And the second one, which I, I, I think was uh, um, particularly interesting, was the Netherlands uh, uh, research indicated that you could detect the virus days prior to the first clinically confirmed case of COVID-19. Um, the city of Loma was not selected for the first round of testing, uh, but we were selected uh, for the second round of testing. That second round of testing uh, started in May, uh, and there were approximately 400 wastewater treatment plants throughout the United States that were participating in this study. Uh, basically, it involved sampling the wastewater, entering the wastewater treatment plant uh, once a week and sending that sample to uh, Biobot for analysis of the COVID-19 uh, virus. Uh, next slide, Susan. Biobot really experienced a tremendous increase in its demand, in the demand for its services. Uh, and it was over capacity. And, and this was really more clearly demonstrated by the fact that it was taking over a week for us to get uh, uh, results. Uh, the second incident that happened was Biobot increased its price by uh, tenfold. Um, there are several front range wastewater utilities that were participating in this project uh, with Biobot. Uh, they, did, they did not think this was a viable uh, path forward. So 17 front range utilities, including the city of Longmont, um, and the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment collaborated in putting together a proposal for monitoring doing wastewater surveillance of the COVID-19 uh, virus, monitoring for the COVID virus in wastewater. Uh, these 17 utilities represent over 3 million people in Colorado or approximately 60% of the population in Colorado. The proposal itself includes the services of a epidemiologist that is going to help with the interpretation of the data. Federal funding to the extent of $520,000 was approved and the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment is working on finalizing the work plan uh, and we believe it'll be completed in a couple of weeks. Next slide, Susan. The project uh, uh, with the, uh, the Front Range collaboration involves sampling of the wastewater, entering the wastewater treatment plant twice a week for one year. 
The analysis will be done by the Colorado State University Laboratory uh, with a three-day turnaround, which is fantastic. Uh, our price for this is in-kind contribution. Uh, that in-kind contribution is in the form of us doing the sampling and us shipping uh, the sample to uh, the Col Colorado State University Laboratory. Our participation in this project is going to result in consistent generation and use of the data, consistent public me messaging, and provide comprehensive statewide information regarding the COVID-19 virus. We'll, re we'll be returning in a couple of weeks, a few weeks uh, with an IGA uh, for approval of an IGA. Next, short presentation. Uh, if you, uh, thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to uh, try and answer them. All right, I don't see any, but thank you very much. Creative, uh, very scientific based uh, way of tracking the virus. Appreciate your work. Yeah, Roberto actually caught me. I got my meetings mixed up. It is on the 25th where we're bringing this, so good catch, Roberto. And um, I think the value is we're seeing the results now, but the delay in the testing actually is hard for us to figure out what's going on. Um, the real value in this is twice a week in the three-day turnaround, which really when you then couple that with the case data, when you can start overlaying it, you can see, I hope, some really interesting perspectives. Um, to be very clear, many people will talk about this as being a way to determine how many cases you have in the community. The science isn't there for that. And Roberto has drilled that in my head. It's really to just look at the prevalence in the system um, to understand maybe what's coming at you in the future. Um, and as we start um, entering into this and getting more data, um, to his point, we'll have an epidemiologist working with us and, and we can share that with you all and it'll be more timely in terms of looking to the future. The, um, the next thing I wanted to update you all on, and this is um, actually really good news. Um, I, I've got to find the email on this to make sure I, I get all my facts correct. Uh, but as you all know, the council uh, voted uh, to um, to do the tokens for the um, food chip for the food program for the $25. Um, we actually partnered with a number of groups to get this done. So the Chamber of Commerce um, operate, um, agreed to manage the program. We worked with the Tinker Mill and they created 200 of those $25 tokens. We then gave those out to the folks that were in the, the free meal program. This is where I lost uh, Sandy's email where she gave me all the specifics, but the groups that we work with on a normal basis um, that we assist in um, with providing food. Um, and uh, the good news is um, we're also partnered with about 50 local restaurants and they're starting to report back that they're actually seeing those tokens come into their restaurants. Um, they're really excited about participating in it, um, getting really positive feedback from those individuals where we, uh, that received them. Uh, but here's probably the best news. Um, we recently were um, contacted by two apartment complexes um, and they indicated that they wanted to figure out how they could purchase those tokens so that they could give them to their residents. And I think that's really the positive side to this story is where you're actually seeing, um, you know, private businesses in our community saying, we really like this idea that the council developed and implemented and we want to be part of it. So I wanted to share that with you all um, because that's what you like to see when you when you do these types of things is really getting the public to be involved in supporting those those projects. So that's a bit of good news as, as we try some of these things out. That's my update for today. If you all have any questions generally about the COVID world, I'll be happy to answer them. All right, well, we appreciate your updates and we don't see any hands. So thank you very much. Let's go ahead and move on to first call, public invited to be heard.
Oh, did you hear me? I said, let's take a three minute break as we uh, wait for people to call in here. All right, back in three. All right, everybody, let's go. All right, how many Mayor, people, how many are in the queue? If we could wait just another 30 seconds or so, please. Sure. How many are in the queue so far? We don't have anyone at this moment. We're just okay. going to let the slide come down from the live stream, which takes about another 30 seconds. Sounds good to me. Okay. I can't remember a council meeting where we didn't have any, at least one member of the public must mean they're all happy with us. All right, the slide just came down from the live stream. You may begin. All right, I mean, begin or go on? Go on. <laughs> all right, great. Let's move on to the consent agenda. An introduction and reading by title, the first reading of ordinances. Can you go ahead and read that for us, Don? I can, Mayor. I'll need lots of breath. It's a long one tonight. It is. <laughs> ordinance item 9A is Ordinance 2020-30, a bill for an ordinance making additional appropriations for expenses and liabilities of the City of Longmont for the fiscal year beginning January 1st, 2020. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for August 25th, 2020. 9B is Ordinance 2020-31. A bill for an ordinance amending titles 4.04, 4.05, and 6.08 of the Longmont Municipal Code on sales and use tax, 
lodger's tax and retail business licenses, and creating a new code section 4.04.105 for the purpose of enacting the Colorado Municipal League's model ordinance on economic nexus and marketplace facilitators for self-collecting home rule municipalities as part of a statewide sales tax simplification effort. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for August 25th, 2020. 9C is ordinance 2020-32, a bill for an ordinance amending title 6.08 of the Longmont Municipal Code on retail business license. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for August 25th, 2020. 9D is ordinance 2020-33, a bill for an ordinance submitting to the registered electors of the city of Longmont, Colorado at a special municipal election to be held on November 3rd, 2020, an amendment to the city of Longmont home rule charter to allow for the lease of city property for up to 30 years. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for August 25th, 2020. 9E is resolution 2020-69, a resolution of the Longmont City Council calling a special municipal election to be held Tuesday, November 3rd, 2020, concerning issuing bonds payable from the city's water utilities enterprise revenues to finance water capital projects and an amendment to the city of Longmont Home Rule Charter to allow for leases of city property for up to 30 years. 9F is resolution 2020-70, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and Boulder County for the conduct and administration of the 2020 general election to be held November 3rd, 2020. 9G is Resolution 2020-71, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and Weld County for the conduct and co coordination of the November 3rd, 2020 election. 9H is Resolution 2020-72, a resolution of the Longmont City Council submitting a ballot question to the registered electors of the city of Longmont, Colorado at a special municipal election to be held November 3rd, 2020, concerning issuing bonds payable from the city's water utility enterprise revenues to finance water capital projects. 9I is Resolution 2020-73, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the amendment to an intergovernmental agreement between the City of Longmont and Colorado Department of Human Services Office of Behavioral Health for a grant to support the Longmont Public Safety LEAD program. 9J, Resolution 2020-74, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the amendment to intergovernmental agreement between the City of Longmont and Colorado Department of Human Services Office of Behavioral Health for a grant to support the Longmont Public Safety Crisis Outreach Response and Engagement Team, core team. 9K, Resolution 2020-75, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City of Longmont and the Colorado Department of Public Safety for the Emergency Management Performance Grant. 9L is Resolution 2020-76, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the Project Partnership Intergovernmental Agreement between the City of Longmont and Department of the Army for the St. Vrain Creek Flood Risk Management Project under Section 205. 9M is Resolution 2020-77, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the First Amendment to the Fiber Use License Intergovernmental Agreement between the City of Longmont and Platte River Power Authority. 9N is Resolution 2020-78, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving a voluntary alternative agreement for the spoke apartments as satisfaction of the city's inclusionary housing requirements. And 9O is approved loan term extension request from the Longmont Housing Development Corporation on their Hover Crossing land purchase loan. Phew. All right, uh, Councilmember Martin. I move the consent agenda. I'll second it. Mayor, I, I apologize in your script. Staff would like to remove 9N for, the, for a presentation. Uh, okay. Um, okay, we can do that. That's fine. Uh, Dr. Waters? Uh, uh, can we remove item uh, 9 uh, O as well? I, I have a question about the length of that extension. I think there were a couple of options. So uh, I'm going to take the motion as being moving. Uh, the motion is to move the consent agenda less N and O, unless there's an objection. All right, all in favor, sir? Aye. 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 Oppose, say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. And we've got us, I've got my, my phone has kind of blown up, at least by two people. Um, can we just, uh, can we double check? So there were two members of the public and they're both saying the same thing. They said, um, it says that, uh, uh, that when they tried calling in for public invited, first call public invited to be heard, the system was telling them that the meeting is not started yet and to call back later. Does that make sense? Uh, Councilmember Christensen? Yeah, I just got an email with the same message. So there's something uh, wrong. So could we, could we look at that, Susan? 
and then uh, take a brief moment and I'd like to go back to, before we move on to the items on second reading and an item N and O, I'd like to have that public first call. Yes, Mayor. Give me one minute. Great. Let me just double check that our meeting ID is correct. Mayor, so it does look like we displayed an incorrect meeting ID, and that's why they weren't able to join us. Okay, the then, then I'm going to go ahead. Let's go ahead and go back. I'm going to open up uh, first call public invited to be heard. And uh, we apologize to those members of the public looking to get in. So, so happy to know that people aren't all happy with the job we're doing. Um, let's go ahead and uh, take another three minute break as people call and get in the queue. And um, if you can't get in the queue, um, those of you who texted me and those of you who texted or emailed um, uh, Council Member Christensen, if you could reach out to us, if it's not working, we'll, we'll fix it. So, all right, great. Then we'll be back in three minutes. And I am being told it's working now, so that's good. The callers are coming in, Mayor, so looks like it's working.
All right, let's go ahead and start then. Let's go ahead and close the, the call in line. How many do we have in the queue? At least three. Mayor, it's telling me nine, but I'm gonna let nine. Them. Okay. Net them all. Cool. Let's go for it. Those of you who are in the queue, um, I'll go ahead and you're gonna have three minutes to present, at which time I'll have to cut you off, no matter how awesome your, your statement. Our first caller to be unmuted, your phone number ends in 353. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Caller 353, can you unmute? I'm having a hard time unmuting you. Let's go, let's come back to them. Let's go on to the next one. The next caller, your phone number ends in 370. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. I'm wondering if our system is still not down or something is not working. Yeah, I'm not sure, Mayor. Let's try again. Caller 370. Can you unmute yourself? Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Hello, Hello 353. Three. Three. Yes, you may begin. Three, five, yeah, okay. Uh, my name is Pat Davis, 1709 Harvard Street, Longmont, uh, Mayor and members of the City Council. I wish to speak to the bill amending Chapter 4.10 of the Longmont Municipal Code on Special Districts, Policies, and Procedures. I ask you to vote yes on this bill. I understand that a yes vote will reinstate the previous ordinance as amended in 2012, thus rescinding the current ordinance approved in February 2019 that allowed for residential metro districts. However, I am confused about one area that may be a part of tonight's bill. Did the council approve of changes in language to this bill, changes that are now identified as amendments 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 10? I went back over previous meetings and I could never find a time where you had actually voted approval of these amendments. Uh, I don't believe they're necessary and would like to see them eliminated. Regardless, this discussion has gone on way too long, almost a year and five months now. Uh, it is time to wrap it up and lock in the ordinance of 2012. There are many other important issues that have taken a backseat to this subject and it is past time to move forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Davis. All right, next. The next caller we're going to try again is 370. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Can you unmute your phone? All right, let's, let's keep, let's just keep, if they don't answer immediately, let's just keep rotating to the end. Okay, caller 470, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Four seven zero. There you go. Hello. 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 Are we yes, connected? We, yes, we are. You may begin. Please state your Excellent. name. This, this is Michael Belmont at eight forty one Tenacity Drive. Greetings all, and thanks for the opportunity to address council. I understand that it, at the upcoming August twenty fifth council meeting, you will be deciding on whether or not to renew the contract with Detlev. Helmig for air monitoring at Union and uh, Longmont Airport. This monitoring has been never really been more important. As you know, our air quality has been showing spikes in dangerous ozone levels triggered by pollutants such as VOCs, as well as other compounds extremely destructive to human health. So please consider the following. We have consistently received an F rating from the American Lung Association for Air Quality in our area in recent years. In order to hope to correct this, we must have a thorough understanding of the trends, sources, and causes of these unacceptable levels, which can only be determined by persistent monitoring with the best available equipment and expertise. I believe you 
initially conducted several community presentations around monitoring and Detlev made a couple of presentations to council after which you recognize the community support as well as the importance and timeliness of air monitoring when this uh, a year ago or so. It is my understanding that we now own the expensive equipment that is required to continue air monitoring so it would not make sense to simply abandon that equipment at this most critical time. Now, some may say that we can save money by not properly and accurately monitoring our air, but I say that degrading air quality unchecked has been widely proven to trigger massive increases in the cost of health care from the devastating physical harm it wreaks upon local communities. And finally, if we cannot show that we care about failing air quality in our, or potentially failing air quality in our community, and that we are resolute about monitoring and improving it, how many desirable businesses that otherwise would consider locating in and around Longmont will decline to do so because of our negligence around the, one of the most important quality of life factors, clean air. I need to not reiterate what is now known among you as the extensive resume of De Liv Helmig's ex expertise and experience as one of the country's finest, most respected scientists in atmospheric research. Thus, I urge you to vote to renew the contract with him at the August 25th council meeting to continue the critical, important monitoring of our air quality. Thanks so much. Our next guest, your phone number ends in 777. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Caller 777, there you go. Can you hear me? We sure can, you may begin. Hello. Yes, uh, good evening, my name is Abe Melendez. I'm at 1543 South Kaufman, and thank you for the opportunity for let us, uh, letting us speak. We are calling on uh, the street that, I've been there since 1981, but, and they're with, uh, uh, them making us now, with the light going in up on Pace and South Kaufman, we're sitting a lot, seeing a lot of traffic that's coming through and it's just, uh, our community is is uh, now mostly, there's families that have that have children and we're starting to see a lot of, uh, a lot of traffic, a lot of speeding, a lot of vehicles. And uh, we'd like to see if we can get that looked at and, and uh, uh, See if we can do something to slow that down, or not have, not have the high speed, the, you know, the the amount of cars that go through there. So, um, that's what we're we're hoping we can get done. If if the council could look at that for us, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next caller, your phone number ends in 795. I'm going to ask you to unmute. 795. Hello, can you hear me? I sure can. You may begin. All right. This this is Megan Williams, 1213 Spruce Avenue. Um, I'm here, Council and uh, Karen Roney and uh, Nancy Kerr, to ask you to look at um, in uh, increasing the access to the library. There is a very large sign that hangs on the outside of the library that states, because access equals opportunity. I do not think that our library is currently providing that access, especially to our more vulnerable populations. Next week, parents will once again be forced to play a much more intensive role in the education of their children. All of this while providing nearly no access to the public library for a working parent. Our library is currently open 10 to four, Monday through Saturday, for curbside and limited inside services, with the kids and teens section only open from 10 to one, with a limit of only 10 people inside. This provides virtually no opportunity for a two-parent working household to access materials for their kids. I'm an educator. My own two kids, sixth and ninth grade, will be at home all day on their own doing online school while I am in the school building teaching other kids. 
trying to teach them, keep them excited, engaged, and motivated about learning proved to be very challenging in the spring, especially without the resources of our library. Thank goodness private entities in our communities, like the used bookstores and little free libraries, existed to help get materials. I've done a search of the libraries in our surrounding communities, like Loveland, Erie, Carbon Valley, Fort Collins, Boulder, and Greeley. The Longmont Library has the least access of any of these surrounding libraries. I feel as though everyone should have ample access to the library, especially given the fact that I'm still paying taxes for these services. Perhaps if the library and their staff were in danger of losing their jobs and having to shut down, like our local retailers and used bookstores were, they would be in more of a hurry to increase usership and access. Please expand hours so that more people can access our awesome library. I think there are plenty of ways that our library can still prioritize safety and expand access for more people, just like our private retailers have had to do. Our kids are going to be asked to once again sit in front of screens for the majority of their days this fall. I would love for them to be able to engage in a written book. The only opportunity to get the materials currently for a working uh, daytime parent is on Saturday from 10 to 1 with 10 people at a time. If each person, let's say, is in the library for 30 minutes, that only allows for approximately 60 people a week to access the kids and teens section outside of average working hours. Once again, please consider expanding the library hours to provide more access for our um, entire community, especially our families with children. Thank you so much for your time, Council. Thanks, Megan. Our next caller, your phone number ends in 932. I'm going to ask you to unmute. 932. All right, I'm going to go on to the next caller. Your last three digits of your phone number ends in 616. I'm going to ask you to unmute. 616. Hello? Hello. All right, I'm going to go this, on to the next caller. Your it's probably best that you stop the live stream. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Oh, okay. I will do that. Okay, uh, yes, this is Linda Schlocky. I'm at 2307 Sherry Mar Street, and I would like you to um, please bring to a vote to show that we would no longer have special residential uh, metro districts in our community. When I attended uh, the Colorado uh, Real Estate School, my instructor was not was also a real estate attorney, and he uh, said, said for us to beware of uh, special uh, metro residential districts because they could be a real financial problem for uh, homeowners and home buyers. And uh, just recently, I talked to a friend out of Firestone who was in one of those districts. Uh, they sold her the house a couple years ago, uh, emphasizing that there would be no homeowners association. However, after she purchased the house, she realized that she was paying all these fees or taxes to the developer or owner of the metro district uh, without having a vote on it and without having much say as to where it goes. Uh, not so long ago, an investigative reporter for the Denver Post pointed out uh, there are numerous problems with um, special metro residential districts in the state of Colorado. Um, my friend in Firestone and her neighbors are trying to find a way to change it, but unfortunately, it's going to be very difficult under Colorado law. Uh, for the most part, these uh, special districts have not been an advantage to the homeowners, home buyers, or the community at large. Thank you for your consideration of, of that issue. I think our community would be better without special metro districts. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next caller 
is 927. 927, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Can you hear me? If you're listening to the live stream, it's probably best that you turn the live stream off and just listen to your phone. Looks like you're unmuted. I, Do you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? We sure can. You may begin. Uh, my name is Laura Lee Hinton. I live at 1242 Judson Street. I was going to speak to the municipal district. But I ask for your yes vote, and that's that. I won't go on with that. But during the meet, during previous times, you said the the statewide ban on masks is due to expire. I would like the city to put in a citywide ban on masks. I believe that is possible. I'm not sure, but I believe it's possible. And you opened up Main Street, and they are not, the restaurants are not following the guidelines and keeping the tables six feet apart. Uh, I have, I'm old, and I have COPD. I have been stuck in this damn house since March. And it just really annoys me. I am doing my part. And I do not think the council has gotten tough enough on gatherings and masking, etc. And I'm speaking to the woman who talked about the library. If I can, I will give my telephone number and I would like her to call me. There are ways you can access the catalog online and they will deliver the books to your car. I do not think we should put the librarians at risk because of children. I mean, they need to be educated, but there are other ways to get the books. If you have the title, you can go online and put a hold on them, drive up to the library, and they will bring the books to your car. And I really took umbrage to her saying things about the librarians. They work their tails off. And it's not the librarians that set the rules for the library, it's the council. Thank you, stay well, stay happy. And I'm sorry I sounded like a Kregman since. Thank you. All right, our next guest, we're gonna try 370 again. You should be able to unmute your phone. Your phone number ends in 370. Can you hear me? There yes, you this are. This is Jim Gibson. Can you hear me? We sure can, thank you. You may begin. Uh, excellent. Good evening, my name is Jim Gibson of Denver. I'm um, with a group called uh, uh, Citizens for Metropolitan District. We're, reform. It's a group of metro district homeowners and other concerned citizens around the state. Uh, currently in most states until the 1980s in Colorado, the cost of infrastructure for a new residential community has been paid for with the cost of the lot. The cost of the lot equals the cost of the land, the cost of the housing, the cost of the infrastructure and profit for the developer. And often the average cost of the infrastructure has been about $30,000 a lot, including profit to the developer. In the 1980s, developers in Colorado persuaded the state legislature to enable them to create and run a separate government. As you all well know, it's called a metro district. Why? Because metro districts allow developers to shift the risk of their investment from themselves to the homeowners. The developer creates and runs what becomes in effect a private government. The developer eliminates the right of the residents to vote on future taxes and bond debt. The developer decides how much to tax the residents. The developer takes that tax and pays it to himself. All the while, there's no accountability of the residents for how the money is actually spent. The development community claims it needs the money to pay for infrastructure, but the cost of the lots is just as high as it was before Metro districts. 
and the developers refuse to, again, account for how the money is spent. The end result is disastrous for homeowners. Metro district taxes are much higher than non-metro district taxes for the same house and infrastructure. Homeowners lose control over their financial future because they're stripped of their rights to control their taxes and debt. In some cases, district residents have become like credit card holders who cannot make their minimum payments, not able to even keep up with the interest on their debt. Their debt just continues to grow and grow over time. Homeowners must also pay for the additional cost of lawyers, accountants, engineers, and management companies to run metro districts with no real added value to the community. Importantly, homeowner tolerance for other taxes becomes exhausting. After paying higher taxes and fees, residents are unwilling to pay more taxes for other important priorities like police, roads, schools, mental health, etc. As we know, there's only so much taxes taxpayers will pay. Finally, cities and counties have to pay for additional staffing costs if they're to responsibly oversee metro district financial governance. City Council members, please restore Longmont's ban on residential metro districts. Thank you very much for your time this evening. I'm more than happy to an answer any questions you might have. All right, was that the last one? No, Mayor, we have two more. All right, let's keep going. Uh, the next caller, I'm going to unmute your caller, 932. 932 are the last three digits. Can you unmute yourself? There you go. Hello? Can you, okay, yes. can you hear me? We sure can. Okay. I'm Carolyn Howard. I live at 1534 South Kaufman Street. Good evening, Mayor Bagley and the council members. I am speaking once again tonight regarding the traffic signal being placed at the intersection of Pike Road and South Coffin Street. I, along with many residents along South Coffin Street, have concerns about the placement of this signal. There are many questions city staff are unwilling or unable to answer relating to how this decision was made, as it is disregarding a number of local, state, and federal guidelines requiring many exceptions to the code. Indeed, it goes against much of the envisioned Longmont growth plan in both retaining the roadway characteristics by functional classification, minimizing risks to the health and safety of residents in existing neighborhoods, and by protecting the distinct character and quality of life of the existing community. There is not another traffic signal in the city at the intersection of a local residential street. After weeks of communicating with city staff and not receiving adequate answers, our street is now listed on the traffic mitigation website's collector street prioritization list. The city staff told us several times that the signal would not change the functional classification of our local, our local residential street. The city made the changes to the pipe road improvement project without allowing the public an appropriate chance to comment. The changes were made because of a few local residents in the area without informing the residents that will be most affected by this change. In fact, there were meetings in which our neighborhood specifically were not invited to. We have residents that need to access their properties in which their driveways are just 20 yards from this future traffic signal. This, busy, this street is a busy bicycle connector between the Lobo Trail and the St. Vrain Greenway. We have 25 to 30 children growing up on the street, which of, most of which are under the age of 10. There are 28 households that will directly experience increased through traffic due to this traffic signal, legitimizing our street as a through street, and another 62 households living on the side street whose children also utilize our street to travel to school and visit friends and neighbors. The street should not be a cut through for other neighborhood residents and people commuting into town. I am asking the council to please look into this matter and to help our neighborhood understand why so many codes were disregarded and why we were left out of these discussions. Thank you for your time. And I'm also against the, uh, <laughs> the district. I don't like that idea at all, the Metro district. So I just thought I'd throw that up in. Have a good evening, thank you. Thank you. Our last caller, you're only identified as call in user. So I'm gonna ask you to unmute, you're the last one. Go ahead and unmute yourself. I see that you're unmuted, can you hear us? Can you say something? Oh, 
All right, let's go ahead and wrap it up. Sounds like it's uh, might be a phantom number they hung up. Um, they muted and then they unmuted. One minute, Mayor. All Can right. you hear me? Call in user. Can you hear me? All I right. sure Hello. can. Yes, we can hear you can now. You may begin. Perfect. Thank you. This is Lori Stanley at 1015 Longs Peak Avenue. And um, I am calling regarding the issue of the five foot setback. And I thank Councilman Waters and Mayor Bagley for bringing back the issue of the five foot setback specifically related to the ADU, which is an accessory dwelling unit in specifically this neighborhood of Old Town, in, which is a single family neighborhood. And a few years ago, it was the rules or regulations were changed so that the side step back in this neighborhood was five feet and did not require a variance. So any building re needing a five foot step back in our opinion should need a variance to allow neighborhood input prior to the permit being issued. The, um, the regulation passed a few years ago, making it so that a five foot setback was no longer needed, um, has caused hardship in this neighborhood, which is single family old um, houses with large trees and limited access from the streets. Um, and a very large ADU was permitted five feet from our back fence and impacts five to six houses, um, not counting the kitty corner houses from their yard. Um, so no neighborhood impact or input was allowed, even though I specifically called several times ahead of time when we saw that he was considering building something. So it's caused undue hardship for our neighborhood. There's two more potential ADUs in the works within one block of here. And so I ask that you urgently consider to make a variance required for a five foot setback. And I know there's been concern that there's not city staff to handle the number of variances that would need to be issued, but it really does impact our neighborhood. And if you would like to see a negative impact, you're welcome to come knock on my door and see through our backyard. I know the argument has also been made that we need more affordable housing. And I don't think in our, it doesn't have anything to do with affordable housing when they're charging $1,600 at least for a 900 square foot house. So if you would please urgently consider this, I would appreciate it. Thank you for your time and for all your hard work. Thank you. All right, was that it? Yes, Mayor. All right, so we caught that mistake. Now let's move on to Ordinances on second reading and public hearings on any matter. Um, let's go ahead with uh, or, uh, item 10A, Ordinance 2020-11, a bill for an ordinance amending chapter 4.10 of the Longmont Municipal Code on special districts, districts, policies, and procedures. Um, Mayor Pro Tem, Aaron Rodriguez, we're gonna go with you. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak real quick on what has unfortunately become somewhat of a wedge issue for city council. Don't know if that's so much the case for our residents of Longmont. Anyway, I would just at this time like to give a brief statement and uh, followed by a motion. Um, so just a, a quick history of the conversation. The November 2017 to November 2019 City Council uh, changed city code to allow for residential metro districts in a split vote. I believe at the time was four to three. Uh, then an election happened in 2019 and the city council revisited the item uh, with I believe a somewhat similar split vote, bringing a motion to, I guess, bring us back in time to the 2012 ordinance uh, saying that residential metro districts were only allowable in the case of a uh, mixed use uh, development. Uh, so as you can see, the councils, both last council and this council, have had very different views on the subject. And unfortunately, uh, as somebody who spent a decent amount of time calling all of the various council members and, and trying to see if there was any way we'd come to a consensus of compromise on the issue, I, I just am not convinced at this time that 
there's any but any way to move any of the our, our council members, my fellow colleagues, off of their particular viewpoints concerning metro districts. And so it kind of brings me to the point that things can change. The 2017-2019 council changed the, the law. This council is essentially probably set up to change it again. And my guess is that depending on how the election goes in 2021, next year, there's a possibility it could change again. So I hope nobody feels that on whichever side of the argument you fall on that this is a permanent solution one way or another. Which actually brings me to the statements made by Councilmember Martin in the uh, media from, I believe the Times call, at least that was the one I read, stating that uh, these ordinances are likely outdated. Um, I think Councilmember Martin is probably correct that both the allowance for metro districts as it stands, as well as what we're about to likely vote on, are probably both outdated once we come through this pandemic. Once we see what the actual challenges are facing Longmont, knowing that this is all going to change, uh, it's, it's very likely that numbers could change in many different ways. And so it's possible and likely that both ordinances will be outdated at which point I hope that whoever's sitting on council makes the right and sane choice uh, to continue to address what I am only assuming will not just be a Longmont problem, but uh, a Colorado problem in general, addressing affordable and attainable housing. Um, I, I'm hoping that my fellow colleagues will recognize that we've pretty much discussed this ad nauseum for a couple years now. And we're probably all well aware of each other's uh, points. And I, I don't feel that any council member is being uh, disingenuous or nefarious in their points of view. We all just have, in my opinion, uh, different best interests uh, at heart for what's best for Longmont. And I don't think that's a shortcoming in anybody's character. Um, as such, uh, I'm not here to castigate anybody's point of view on the issue. Rather, just to acknowledge that we're not going to agree and that we should just come up with some closure on the issue until potentially another council decides to bring it back up again. With that, I move to approve Ordinance 202011. Thank you. Second. I'm going to go ahead and call the question. So it's not debatable. We're going to vote on it. If five of us vote to vote on the motion without debate, we can do it. All in favor? And it hasn't been seconded, so it doesn't really matter. Second. I did. All right, okay. So it's been moved by myself and seconded by Councilmember Rodriguez. All in favor of just voting without debate, say aye. 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 Uh, those opposed, say nay. 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 All right, I'm gonna have to take a, I'm gonna have to take a, a hand in the air about it. Okay, raise your hand if you called the question, aye. Okay, the, the motion passed and then nay was Count Dr. Waters and Council Mayor Martin. So the ayes ha uh, have it, it's a super majority. So debate ends, let's go ahead and vote on the motion. All in favor of Council Member Rodriguez's, go ahead, Council Member Rodriguez. No, getting ready to vote. Oh, okay. All in favor of the motion of passing uh, ordinance 2020 20, ordinance 2020-11 say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. 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 All right. I want to raise a point of order. Okay, hold on one second. So ayes have it five to two. Uh, that is, and with Council Dr. Waters and Councilman Martin uh, opposing. Go ahead, Dr. Waters. I, 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 I'm curious why we didn't have a public hearing on this. Wasn't this a public hearing? You know what? You were absolutely right, Dr. Waters. I was so anxious to avoid the vitriol and the discontent that I forgot. So we're going to actually go ahead and open it up for public hearing at this time. And if there's so, public does hearing, this, so we have a vote that's already been taken before no, no, public no, hearing. There, there's no, there's no, there, the, if there is a public hearing, we will revote. That is absolutely true. You are spot on. 
So how many people are in the queue for public hearing? Actually, let's go ahead and take a three minute break and uh, we'll come back. Thank you, Dr. Waters. We're not back from break yet. How many people are in the queue? Mayor, I'm seeing no one at this moment and we're about a minute and a half in. All right, let's give it another 60 seconds. So about 30 seconds on the delay um, will bring us at about four minutes. Mayor, we have two callers when you're ready. All right, let's go, let's go ahead and come back. And uh, we're gonna go ahead, well, we're gonna have to re-vote because uh, Dr. Waters is correct. So with uh, uh, 
uh, I can call the we can call the question, but what we can't do is skip the public hearing. So we'll have to go ahead and revote. That vote was out of order. So let's go ahead and start and open the public hearing at this time on Ordinance 2020-11. And can we just take it in the order the callers called in, please? Yes, Mayor. The first caller I'm going to wait, 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 time, time out, time out. Let's wait till Councilmember Waters is back. Mayor, he appears to be ready. All right, let's go ahead. First caller, I'm going to unmute. Your phone number ends in 353. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Three five three, can you unmute? Can you hear me? I sure can. You Hello, may begin. This is you may begin. Okay. I'm not quite sure, but I would I'm just calling in to support the vote of council members Rodriguez. Oh, I'm sorry, this is Pat Davis, 1709 Harvard. I'm calling in to support the vote of Council Members Rodriguez, Peck, Hidalgo, Faring, and Christensen on this, and I can't remember the number as you explained it on the agenda, but it relates to the 2012 ordinance, going back to the 2012 ordinance. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So um, I'm not sure anyway, what else I can say except I support... Uh, those members who voted uh, yes. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. And the next. next, the next caller. Your phone number ends in nine two seven. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Nine two seven. I believe that. Okay. Yes. Shall I proceed? Yes, you may. This, this is Laura Lee Hinton again, and I support going back to the original ordinance, the 2017, I believe, ordinance. Do I have to say more or is that it? That's all you got to say. That's all you got to say, if that's all you want to say. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Begley. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Lurley. That all was right. the last one. All right. So we're going to have to revote. Councilmember Martin? We'll go ahead and close the public hearing at this time. And then there was, there was a, we have to revote on the matter. But go ahead, Councilmember Martin. Well, do we, how far back do we have to start? I also we, would like to introduce a motion. All right. Well, there's a, we, we, we called the question and we, and we voted on it. And so. Uh, no, well, I was there when that happened, Mayor Bagley, but that was out of order because you hadn't had the public hearing. Well, we so you have to call on, on Aaron and does he have to make his statement again or does he have to make his motion again? I think mm -hmm. he does have to make his motion again. No, we but, just can't, we just can't vote on the motion until we have a public hearing. But, but go ahead, Councilor Martin. Well, if you're not going to let me introduce a, a motion of my own, then it isn't worth my making the statement either. I have other outlets. Thank you. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and vote. Let's go ahead and vote the motion uh, submitted uh, by uh, Councilor Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez was uh, a motion to pass Ordinance 2020-11 as written. The bill for an ordinance amending Chapters 4.10 of the Long Municipal Code on Special Districts Policies and Procedures. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. 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 All right. So the motion carries five to two with council members Martin and Waters uh, against. All right. Tough. That, that, that was a easy vote for a very difficult, lengthy uh, discussion over the last year plus. So thank you. All right. Let's move on to ordinance 2020-29, a bill for an ordinance amending chapter 14.52, section 14.52.030 of the Lama Municipal Code on compensation for disposition of open space property. Um, let's go ahead and open the public hearing and do this one right this time. All right. Let's go ahead and take a three minute break as we open up the phones.
All right, how many have we got? All right, we're going to wait. Let's wait another 60, 60 seconds. Susan, you have one that needs to be admitted. Do you want me to admit them? Uh, we'll admit them when the mayor's ready. I'm uh, waiting for the slide to stop displaying on the live stream and then we can begin. All right, do we have anybody uh, on the line for the public hearing? Yes, Mayor, we have one caller. I'm gonna let it. Great. And I'm ready to begin when you are. Let's Mayor. go ahead and let's go ahead and start. Okay. Caller nine two seven. I'm going to unmute you. Do you hear me? There you go. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have called in because I have just a knee jerk opinion, and that shouldn't be how this goes. I'm sorry to have taken your time. That was the only caller, Mayor. All right, let's go ahead and close the public hearing. Um, let's go ahead. Do we have a vote from or a motion from council? Mr. Mayor. Uh huh. Councilmember uh, Councilmember Rodriguez. Thank you. I move uh, approval of Ordinance Twenty 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 Nine. I'll second. All right, there's a motion. Um, all in favor of passing ordinance 2020-29, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the motion passes unanimously. All right, um, let's move on to item N on the consent agenda. Resolution of Longmont City Council approving a voluntary alternative agreement for the spoke apartments is satisfaction of the city's inclusionary housing requirements. Uh, city staff has a presentation. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This is Kathy Fedler with the, uh, the Housing and Community Investment Division. And um, I will try and keep this as short as possible because it would be nice if um, we would get, get to the point, especially on these, that it um, stays on consent. <laughs> um, so if you could start the, the slides, please. <clears throat> and go to the next one. So this is um, for the Spoke Apartments, which is on um, 518 Kaufman. It is, um, the developer is the Boulder County Housing Authority. Um, and this is the voluntary alternative agreement um, in order uh, to allow them to build affordable rental homes on site. Um, if you remember per our ordinance, develops developments of units for rental housing um, have to use the alternative agreement under E6 um, because of the Telluride decision um, in order to be able to move forward and um, volunteer to provide their affordable housing. Um, they'll be providing 73 total rental homes. Next slide, please. Um, this just shows the, um, the layout and the proposed look of the building. Um, from their site plan. Um, it, on the far left side, oh, um, I guess you can't see my pointer over here, um, 
there is um, the apartments, um, which um, are uh, to the north is um, the uh, 6th, 6th Avenue Plaza. Um, and then in the middle is the, um, and towards the end is the parking garage uh, structure. <clears throat> um, and the bottom um, perspective shows what it would look like from the, I guess you'd say the alley side, um, where you can see that there's three really separate um, structures looking from that um, on the east. <clears throat> the top picture shows from the west on um, Kaufman Street. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, this property is, um, falls under the density cap. Um, so only using the 1.17 acres of housing land um, times the 20 dwelling units per acre shows that 24 units would um, have the inclusionary housing applicable to it. So it exempts sub, uh, 49 of the units because of the high level of density that they're achieving. Um, when you apply the inclusionary housing requirement of 12% to the 24 units that are applicable, that's um, just under uh, three total affordable housing ho um, affordable homes would be required. And the developer is agreeing to provide all 73 of their um, homes as affordable, which is um, a lot more than the minimum that's required. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, next slide, please. So again, 73 affordable homes, 23 of those homes are about 31% are affordable at or below 50% of their median income. 50 homes or 68% are affordable at or below 60% of the area median income. Um, the units will be um, have 59 one bedroom units, 10 two bedroom units and four three bedroom um, units. Next slide. Um, as usual, a annual reporting will be required. Um, the property will be deed restricted to provide the 73 affordable homes. This project is convenient to Main Street with access to transportation options. It is across from the St. Brain Hub, which is a one-stop um, place shop for human service needs of all kinds. Um, and uh, just as a reminder, the LDDA, the city and the county contributed land to this project. Next slide. <clears throat> um, some of the unique public public private partnership <laughs> that this is containing is the structured parking garage will be shared between Boulder County, the DDA, Arlet, um, or um, um, properties and the tax credit partnership that will be building the housing. Um, and a common interest community is formed within the parking garage structure um, allocating a certain number of um, parking spaces to the residential housing um, and um, to the, um, the non-residential parking, the commercial space, and then a leaseback option um, of the parking to um, the DDA and <clears throat> the commercial structure. Next slide. So this does address Council Work Plan's goal um, B1.1 having a diverse housing stock with higher densities, access to high quality public transportation, food and jobs. Um, it um, exceeds the goal of 12% by providing 100% of the units as affordable. Um, it is increasing our affordable homes by um, 130 a year, which is our goal by adding 73 affordable homes. And it does sustain our commitment to meeting our 2035 affordable housing goals. Next slide. So if there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Or I think um, Brian Schumacher is also available if you have questions that I cannot answer. All right, let's go ahead and take it one at a time. Councilmember Christensen. Um, Kathy, I don't really have any questions. I just think this is an excellent um, project uh, by Boulder County <coughs> Housing Services, um, Housing Authority, I'm sorry. Um, it'll give us more parking downtown. It'll give us a lot more affordable housing downtown. It's a, it's everything that affordable housing should be. It's a broad range of uh, affordable income levels and um, it's on a bus line if we can ever get our transportation improved. <laughs> so um, anyway, thank you very much.
Uh, Dr. Waters. Uh, Kathy, just a quick question. In the, in the breakdown of the percentage, uh, percentage of units affordable at, at 60% and in the other levels of affordability, uh, if, we, if, if in our ordinance, uh, we were still at 60% um, of AMI being the, um, being the requirement in the ordinance to comply with to, uh, the 50% of AMI to comply with our ordinance rather than 60%. Would we, have, would we see the, these units in this project? Uh, would we see a shift? Would we see 58 units available at 50% of AMI? as opposed to 50 at 60% and eight at 50%? Uh, um, so I think what you're asking is that if we shifted our um, minimum requirement to 50% AMI um, to be considered affordable under our inclusionary housing ordinance, would we have seen more units available at 50% AMI? Thank you for um, turning my clumsy is that correct? yes into, a, into the right <laughs> question. Um, I would suspect that we would see some more units at 50% um, as long as uh, the tax credit allows up to 60%. Um, it probably wouldn't have made it like 100% affordable at 50% AMI, um, but I think it definitely would have probably increased the number of 50% units in order to, um, to meet the minimum inclusionary housing requirement and to get the maximum fee waivers and fee offsets. Yeah, um, I think sometimes um, we discount how valuable that subsidy con contribution is. Yeah, I'm gonna. Uh, we, it's too late tonight to ask for our ordinances to come back, but that's that's a change that we need to. I I, I advocated for the sixty percent. I think we've learned enough that, that we ought to move that back to where it was, and um, but we'll come back to that later. It's just it plays out pretty vividly. In, in this plan, which I agree with Councilmember Christensen. I think this is a great project. Um, um, I'd, I'd like to see more of it available at 50% at or below. So thank you. All right, seeing nothing else. Uh, I'm gonna go actually go ahead and move uh, resolution 2020-78, a resolution of Longmont City Council approving a voluntary alternative agreement for the spoke apartments and satisfaction the city's inclusionary housing requirements. Second. All right, seeing no further debate. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Dr. Waters, let's turn the time over to you for O of the consent agenda. Thanks, uh, Mayor Bagley. Um, let me open the, open up the item. Uh, Kathy, are you the, are you the uh, staff member on this one? That is me. Um, in the uh, in the council communication, there was a reference to a one or three year extension, and among the options or the recommendations in the re recommendation section, there were four possibilities for council action. One was to extend for a year, one was to extend for three years, um, and it and there I'm not certain what we would have done had we passed that on the on the consent agenda, would that have been a one-year extension or a three-year extension? So I would take it since the recommended option was a three-year, if you would have passed it on consent, that it would have been going with the recommended option, but... I, that's what I wanted to clarify. Um, so I'll move uh, item 8-0 uh, with the three-year extension. Second. Um... I think it was 9-0, is that what you meant? I'm sorry, 9-0, yeah, I'm All right. used That's to right. our other numbers. Sorry, yes, 9-0. Right, approve the loan term extension request for the Longmont Housing Department Corporation on their Hover Crossing land purchase loan for, uh, for three years specifically. Correct. And there was a second by Council Member Martin. All right, so you know for the discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, the motion passes unanimously. All right, let's move on to um, general business, Housing and Human Services Advisory Board recommendations for second quarter 2020 affordable housing funding. Staff has a presentation, I believe. 
This is me again. So thank you for grouping me all together. <laughs> Can we pull up the, um, the slides, please? Um, this is our second quarter um, affordable housing funding um, application cycle that we went out for um, starting in, um, next slide please, <clears throat> um, May, I believe it was. This is a little bit of background just to ground us again. Um, we had about 2.2 million available for 2020, which was made up of um, 858,000 from 2019 carry forward, a million that's added for um, the year 2020, an estimated 137,000 from the marijuana tax for 2020, and an estimated um, 230,000 in program income for 2020 to make up that 2.25 figure. Next slide, please. Um, so what we've allocated so far in affordable housing funding is 1.425 um, million. 100,000 was allocated for the element um, pre-development cost project, 100,000 for the in-between property acquisition project, 500,000 for Longmont family apartments, new construction of rental housing, 250,000 for senior housing options, Cinnamon Park, um, independent rental housing, new construction, and about 475,000 was set aside for um, fee off estimated fee offsets um, for the spoke um, apartments, for Longmont family apartments, and for Cinnamon Park. This leaves us with a balance available of about $800,800. Next slide, please. On the CDBG funding available, that was all allocated in 2020 um, or in early 2020. Um, I think it was in February or March, maybe as late as May, I don't know. I came back, We I know we came back several times on the CDBG funding with the COVID money that was added to it and everything. Anyway, we had about 460,000 available for 2020 competitive applications. And those were allocated to with 160,000 to the in-between property acquisition and 300,000 for um, Longmont Housing Authority's Aspen Meadows apartments, refinance and, and rehab. And I'll just give a brief update, the in-between property acquisition, they did find a property um, and are in the process of acquiring it. I think that's a total of 12 um, units. So that is moving along and the Aspen Meadows refinance project, we are, are moving forward with that too. We expect to um, have a, a closing in mid to late September. Next slide, please. <clears throat> On the home funding, um, if you remember, we allocated our entire um, 2021 um, set aside for Longmont. Um, that is the year that we would get um, the home consortium funding. So we set aside that for the, the spoke apartments um, for the the county's new construction project. Uh, so that's already um, happened as well. Next slide, please. All right, so we did take applications um, for affordable housing funds um, in the April 20th to May 20, 22nd timeframe. We received two applications. One withdrew their application because they were looking for grant funding, which isn't available until we get CDBG funds again. And the other one um, the was um, requesting home CHODO funding. Um, this is a new term, <laughs> not new to me, but new to you guys probably. We don't talk about it much because um, we didn't have a CHODO eligible um, uh, agency until um, Habitat um, met the requirements to become one. So a CHODO is a community housing development organization. It is a special um, eligibility criteria under the home program. Um, and the, the benefit to becoming a CHODO is that their 15% of all home funds each year is set aside specifically for CHODOs. So if you qualify as that, you compete for the, that funding in a much narrower, <clears throat> um, it's a smaller pot of money, but it's also only a couple of organizations that are competing for that. So um, Habitat requested $120,000 in a CHODO grant for their Mountain Brook new construction project. Next slide, please. Um, I went through this already, has to be proved as a CHOTO, 15% is set aside, and um, you can allocate it as part of your local share of home funds. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> 
Um, so the funding recommendation from the Housing and Human Services Advisory Board and the Technical Review Group is to provide $120,000 $120, grant from the city's 2021 funding. It may come from out of the consortium's 2020 funding. The city of Boulder is working out exactly where it's coming from. It'd be considered part of our 2021 funding um, and it will help um, create those eight housing units. Um, so next slide. Okay, so this just catches us up on um, exactly where we stand with the current uh, 2020 funding from all sources. So again, the CDBG funds have all been allocated that we had available and there's a zero down at the bottom in that column. The affordable housing fund is um, showing what we have allocated to date um, for the project specifically and then also what we are setting aside um, for estimated fee offsets. And the blue that goes across the, the towards the bottom is the new funding that would um, uh, provide um, support the Mountain Brook project, Habitat's Mountain Brook project. So the 93,000 is the estimated amount of um, fee offsets for this project. So we are going ahead and setting those aside. And that's why that is increasing the amount um, and lowering the amount that's available now from the affordable housing fund for the rest of 2020. Um, and then we did increase the, um, the home funding uh, for 2021 to a uh, total of 860 and we're done with the home funding. There's nothing else we can wring from that, that stone. So right now we're looking at carrying in um, for the fourth quarter application cycle, $707,800 um, in affordable housing funds. Next slide. <clears throat> so there was a lot of discussion um, as the Housing Advisory Board and the Technical Review Group were considering this project whether or not the city should um, be further subsidizing a nonprofit who is providing the affordable housing on behalf of a for-profit developer. Um, so if a developer is fulfilling the inclusionary housing requirement, if the nonprofit still is a developer fulfilling the inclusionary housing requirement as required, if the nonprofit still needs additional city funding to provide the housing above and beyond the fee waivers and fee offsets that everyone is eligible for under the program. So there was discussion around that and where they ended up was um, they felt that in this particular instance, without further direction from council, um, that the um, Habitat was intending to have the um, for sale housing prices hit about 55% AMI instead of the required 60%. So it'd be an even lower sales price um, if, they, if they can meet it um, and they think they can. So that was the compelling reason why they went ahead and are recommending this um, for funding at this point in time. Um, but what we would like to do is have a discussion around these questions um, with council, probably not tonight, um, so you can think about it a little bit, but we are intending to bring back some proposed inclusionary housing um, code changes in September, likely the end of September. Um, so we could include it for discussion at that point in time. Um, otherwise, I am more than happy to answer questions about this. All right. Thank you very much for your presentation. We really appreciate it. All right. Let's move on to final call public invited to be heard. Let's go ahead and take a two minute break Mayor, while we Mayor, go ahead. Sorry. I do need a motion if you want to accept the recommendation uh, for funding I, Habitat. <laughs> I move that we accept. I move that we accept the the recommendation uh, okay. funding Habitat, and that's been seconded by Councilmember Redougal Faring. Councilmember Christensen, are you opposed? I, yeah, I definitely do want to have a discussion about that. This is um, exactly why. Well, we'll have that discussion in the future, but. Um, I'm, I'm always going to be standing by Habitat for Humanity because they have a long and uh, very good history, but I don't think that this is a particular, this is a good project. It's just wrapped into other um, more difficult things that we need to have simpler things rather than more complicated and fragile things. So 
Anyway, but I'll be voting for this because uh, Habitat does an excellent job of providing uh, homes built with sweat equity and with the education of the people who will be living there and um, with community input, literally with hammers. And <laughs> so they're a great organization. All right, Councilor Mayor Peck. Thank you, Bagley. Um, I would actually like to have the discussion before we vote on taking a position, um, mainly because I want to know if, if we are setting a precedent for the for developers, and is the developer actually providing the is is this just land in lieu? This is what I don't quite get, or is it actually the developers? Uh, affordable housing project because if it is the developers um, giving us that amount then I think we need to discuss where where do we do going forward if this happens again um, because I I was always under the assumption that if they gave land in lieu then whoever built that was responsible for the uh, for the development so that Habitat for Humanity would be responsible for that. But if in fact, it is still part of the inclusionary housing um, requirement of the developer, then there's a question of, of why isn't the developer developing his own affordable housing? So I would, I would like to have the discussion before the vote. All right, well, there's only discussion if people have things to say, either for or against the vote. Councilmember Martin? Um, the question of, of whether the subsidy is being double dipped is separate, but I don't think there should be any rules against a developer um, outsourcing part of his obligation to a, another developer who has more expertise in, in the um, type of development that is fulfilling the uh, um, affordable housing requirement. All right, uh, Councilmember Christensen. I don't wanna have this kind of a situation come back again, ever. We, right now, they donated some land, um, but, and they are going to put in some infrastructure. It's a very small piece of land that could not be really used anyway. Um, and there'll be 24 veterans community project homes and eight uh, shared, they're duplexes. I forget the, the term now. Um, those are good ideas, but both of those entities are paying for that. And that's why they need a, that's why Habitat needs a subsidy from the city. Um, I don't think that in either case that meets the inclusionary housing. It's not a matter of outsourcing it. They're not paying for the cost of the construction or the uh, materials or the labor. And so I don't really understand I've never understood how this meets the affordable, the inclusion. All right, well, we've got a motion on the table and the motion was to uh, accept the Housing and Human Services Advisory Board recommendation for second quarter 2020 affordable housing funding. So let's go ahead and vote. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. All right, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank All right, you. now let's move on to uh, uh, last call, public invited to be heard. If we could go ahead and throw up the number, let's give it two minutes.
Mayor, I'm going to give it another 30 seconds so that slide can leave the live stream. All right, great. And nobody's in the queue yet, right? We have no one in the queue. All right, that just cleared our live stream. There's still no one in the queue. All right, let's go ahead and move on to uh, mayor and council comments. Okay, Councilmember Christensen. Uh, I read in the paper today that Coney Stefan died Saturday in an accident in Greenland. Wait, who did? Coney Stefan. Conrad ah. Stefan was a CU professor, a scientist, um, and a foremost international expert in the Arctic. Through research, writing, and photography, he probably did more than anyone alive to inform us about the Arctic and the damage we're doing to it and to the rest of the natural world. I worked with him on one of my favorite projects uh, to publicize his Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Studies. He was brilliant, he was funny, and he was utterly gracious. He was that rare human being who absolutely loved what he did. His family has suffered a terrible loss, and so have we. I think anyone else who ever met him will also miss him enormously. All right, Councilmember Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Just want to say real quick, I know that we all on occasion uh, let staff know how much we appreciate all the work that they do. And especially now during these very difficult times in the pandemic and all the anxiety around social justice and all the you know, uh, upheaval that's kind of going on in our world these days. But I don't think it is enough that we look at each other and I say to all of you that I respect you all tremendously and I'm very proud to serve with all of you. And while we may disagree and sometimes very emotionally with each other, that I think that we do all have the thing, the best, uh, you know, the best intentions for the city of Longmont. And I would hope that anybody serving in these seats would also have that. But I just wanna let you all know that I very much appreciate serving with you. I respect you all tremendously. And regardless of, of disagreement, you know, I hope that we can continue with the next year and change to make really positive changes for the city. So just, that's all I wanna say, thank you. All right, anyone else? All right, Councilmember Martin. Um, yes, well, since we are appreciating the staff, um, I just would like to say something about the traffic light at uh, um, Pike and Kaufman, uh, which is that the number of people who demanded that traffic light was not a vocal few. It was many people um, who live in the, that neighborhood who came to public invited to be heard um, for weeks on end to try to defend the character of their neighborhood. Um, and I will also say that the um, people of Southmore Park were invited to the same set of meetings as the people of, of Prospect, Rainbow Ridge, uh, and Renaissance. And um, one of the women who wrote to me about uh, the, the stoplight this time around even said she looked at that invitation and decided not to go. So I just want to remind the public that if you really have the expectation that nothing ever changes in your neighborhood, that you need to take the opportunity um, of public engagement that the city of Longmont offers you because uh, we work really hard at it and not everyone can always agree, but if we don't hear from you in time, you may not like the result. Oh, Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, just to piggyback on what Councilwoman Marcia 
Martin said we got an update uh, in our email from Jim Angstead. And um, he said the city has no plans to change South Kaufman Street from a local to a collector. The city's document that designates roadway classification, classification and a change to a roadway classification requires council action. So we have not voted to make that account a uh, collector street, nor has it come before us. So I hope that uh, eases the uh, pain, I guess, that some of the residents are uh, assuming that will not and is not a collector street. Thank you. All right, seeing nobody else, uh, city, ma oops, uh, city manager, Harold. Anything? Yes, Mayor, I do have a couple of comments. One, um, the council members did, um, you all have an email from Jim Angstead um, explaining the issue that came out um, I guess shortly after those comments. The other thing I wanted to talk about, you also will receive an email from Nancy Kerr regarding some of the questions um, concerning the library. Uh, what I can say is I, uh, one of the things I do is I do a weekly, um, WebEx with staff to tell them what's going on. And in that, Nancy mentioned that they were evaluating um, how they look at the library hours in, in the future. Um, and so they are specifically going to look at um, children, teen hours, and some of the other, um, you know, maybe expanding it more broadly. Uh, but the big issue there is, and I want everyone to know, when, when we work with the opening plan on this, we had to work with uh, Boulder County Public Health in terms of those plans. And there was an, a tremendous amount of conversations back and forth on that issue in terms of what met the intent of the executive orders. Every library is different in many ways. And so there may be some that have longer hours. There may be ha some that have shorter hours, but there are a couple of things that come into play in that conversation. One is space and how they operate. And two is the number of staff you have in terms of meeting uh, the requirements within that order. So for example, every one of the conference rooms is full of books because of the dis disinfecting protocol that you have to go through. We've had to move a, a lot of staff into that arena to do it. So what I can tell you is she's evaluating that um, and they will be working with Boulder County Health, but there are many factors that come into play in, in terms of what we can and can't do. Um, and you'll get a more detailed email on that tomorrow. If there's any questions I can answer now, I'd be happy to. Other than that, no comments. All right, great, thanks. Uh, Eugene, anything? No comments, Mayor. Great, can we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right, I'll second that. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right, thanks everybody, have a good night. Good night. We're adjourned. <laughs>